Hey, I'm Alicia from MobilityMastery.com, and today we're going to dive into fascia's role in pain and dysfunction. And just a little disclaimer here, I mean, we're just going to touch on some topics that I think you should be aware of if you want to understand your body and fascia's role in pain and dysfunction, whether that's, you know, injury uh, or soft tissue pain, something like that. Um, and we're just going to touch on a few things. If you want to go a lot deeper with me than I suggest you pay attention to maybe when I open a course because there's just only so much I can do here on YouTube um, in these short videos. But what we're going to do today is just talk about um, the three main pain categories as well as kind of just making sense of pain in general because what is pain? A lot of people don't even know other than it sucks, right? It doesn't feel good. You know what it's like when you feel it and you know that you don't like it, but I think it's really important to understand what's actually happening in your body when you have pain if you want to understand how to eliminate it. Uh, so we're going to dive into that first and I've got just three things here um, I want to touch on. And the first is... No SIBO. <laughs> and before I actually define this for you, I'm going to jump to number two, because some of you probably haven't heard of no SIBO. Some of you probably have, but it's going to make more sense to you when I define number two, because almost everybody, I guarantee you, has heard of this one. Placebo, right? <laughs> so there's placebo and there's no SIBO. So placebo, as everybody knows, is kind of like you take the sugar pill and you feel better, right? And you think maybe you took a pain pill or you took a medication for a condition you're feeling. Um, and of course, they've done tons of studies on this, scientific studies, up to the point of actually like pretending to do a surgery on someone, like taking them in, wheeling them in, you know, making the cuts, but not actually repairing, say, an ACL or an MCL or something like that um, in the knee and then they close the person back up, they make all the drilling noises and everything, um, and the person walks out and says, oh my god, my knee is so much better, the surgery worked. Uh, so placebo is a real thing, it's very interesting to think about. So the brain is super powerful, or maybe said another way, the brain and body, and what the brain and body believe on a nervous system level, super powerful. Uh, so you can have a placebo effect, whether it's your placebo, you know, maybe you're planting a seed in your own mind, like, I believe I'm going to get better, and thus you do get better. Um, but I think it can also be borrowed, right? Like, whether you're taking that sugar pill um, or part of a trial, you know, you're not sure if you got the actual pill or the placebo, but it still works <laughs> for some people. Um, and I would argue it's probably because that person was like, I'm sure I got the actual pill because I feel better. Um, so it could come from someone else. Like, I have plenty of clients come to me in my private practice and tell me, you know, your belief that I'm going to get better was huge in my recovery. I needed to borrow your belief until I could believe it for myself. Now, it's always better if you can believe it for yourself, but it's interesting that you can kind of borrow it from other people too, and it still works. It maybe just takes a little longer. And then nocebo is, of course, the opposite. It's you or somebody else planting the idea that um, you're going to have pain or you're going to get sick or you're not going to get well or it's going to take a year to recover. Um, I mean, we could look at that in so many ways, right? But it's the idea that you have adopted the belief that pain has to be a certain way in your body. It has to be an experience for you, whether, again, that's an injury that you're working to recover. Maybe a doctor told you, Oh, you sprained your ankle? Well, the typical recovery time is six to eight weeks. So here's your, you know, boot. Here's some pills. Go home, you know, rice it and take those six to eight weeks. And so you do exactly that and boom, presto, it's six to eight weeks somewhere in there. You feel better. Now, was it um, placebo? Was it nocebo? I don't know. Some weird combination of both. In my opinion and experience, you can heal a lot faster. So adopting anybody's belief without testing it, without questioning it, um, you know, maybe you want to do that with placebo, I don't know. Um, but I like to actually do it consciously for myself. But I think it's just interesting to think about when we're making sense of pain, 
that it's that we're so suggestible <laughs> we're really suggestible creatures so what's going on um at you know like what is actually going on and i put number three here <laughs> and um we'll see what you think about this with me <laughs> i put reality with a question mark because in my opinion we are sometimes actually in danger like there's actually something going on and our body is getting our attention for a very good reason. And so, you know, it's probably not a great idea to adopt a placebo belief that you're okay and maybe you're really not, maybe you're really in danger. Um, so I put reality with a question mark because the thing about pain is, so if we're gonna talk about pain, making sense of it, um, nocebo is named after nociception. So nociceptors in your body are the nerve receptors that communicate potential threats in an environment where they're basically tasked with, let's say, assessing your shoulder, for example, or one little part of your shoulder or your knee. Um, and if those nociceptors in that area detect a potential threat, that's all they can do is ever detect a potential threat. They send that signal back to the brain. The brain has to try to make sense of it or potentially communicate something to you so you can make sense of it. And it's your job as the owner of your body to find out if there's an actual threat. So your body never knows for sure. It can't really know. It might think something, it might assume something, it might um, instinctively sense something, right? And so, Pain becomes really interesting when you think about it this way because it's always perception, always. But it doesn't mean it's not real. And so the whole thing is you have to figure out is the threat real or is it not real? So what is reality, right? Um, and then these two things are just super important to think about. If you ever go to a practitioner, um, you know, whether it's a, a doctor or a chiropractor or a massage therapist or whatever, um, and they suggest to you that you'll always be in pain, or you know, you'll never recover uh, to your to 100% or anything like that. Uh, please question that. It might be true, it might be, but is it actual reality? Um, or did they just plant the seed there and you took it as gospel, as truth because they're in an authoritative position and you're not? Well, I encourage you to take that authoritative position over your body. You are the only owner of it. Um, you know, that will ever be. And so I encourage you to question everything and adopt your own beliefs and your own sense of, you know, self and being able to determine, is it reality or is it not reality? And everything I do here on Mobility Mastery is meant to educate and empower you on self-assessing so you can determine if there's an actual threat, if there's something really going on. And then a lot of the time you can take care of it yourself. Um, and sometimes you need outside help. So that's just a little bit of making sense of pain. And then we've got um, three main categories here, and I'm gonna return to uh, Fascia's role in all of this in a second. Um, but we've got three main pain categories here. So tendon and ligament injuries uh, is gonna be one of them. And we'll come back uh, one by one. Um, but number two is going to be joint pain. And number three. So please keep in mind, these are like the three main pain categories. It's not the only type. Um, and I'm actually including nerve pain, I think, can happen in a joint or actually in your soft tissue, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, so they can kind of overlap. So that's why I didn't put nerve pain as its own category, but it's certainly in there as a main kind of pain category. Um, so tendons and ligaments, those tendons and ligaments are fascia. They're dense, fibrous, connective tissue. Uh, tendons connect uh, muscle to bone, and then ligaments connect bone to bone. And you know, so you could have something like tendonitis, tendinosis, um, you could have a ligament tear or strain, and those are the general categories for tendon and ligament injuries. And since they're fascia, I think it's pretty clear 
there's a role there that fascia plays in tendon and ligament injuries, right? And what most, you know, people do in the Western medical model when they look at a tendon injury or ligament injury is they isolate the tendon and the ligament and they don't look at it as part of the whole system. And, um, and so we've adopted, you know, standard practice, standard, you know, diagnostics um, for just the tendon or just the ligament. But what I want you to think about here is fascia's role in these types of injuries. Um, and then if there's a role there, then you could probably use fascia release to reverse the injury, right? Or heal a lot quicker. Um, so like one common belief in the Western medical model about tendons, for example, is that they don't get as much blood flow and thus they take a long time to heal. Uh, so a lot of the time, if we're talking about say tendinosis, um, it's a loss of collagen in the tendon. Well, if you've watched any of my other videos, which I encourage you to do, um, we'll link to the important ones below related to this video here for you, but um, collagen is actually synthesized in the extracellular matrix in fascia um, by fibro fibroblasts, and you can definitely up, in my opinion, you can up the increase of production of collagen by releasing fascia so you have a more efficient, effective, functional fascial system that can heal you faster. Um, but the other aspect is uh, a healthy fascial system is going to have a lot of hyaluronic acid in it, and hyaluronic acid is going to help with healing wounds and injuries a lot faster as well. So if you release fascia around a tendon or ligament injury, then it's going to heal a lot faster than if you say isolate it, don't move it, rest it. Um, like one of the things that pumps blood through your body and actually gets it into a tendon or ligament is movement. Um, and of course you don't want to be dumb and re-injure yourself or make it worse, but isolating it and putting yourself in like a boot or a cast or a brace or anything like that, in my opinion, is going to mean a much longer healing time than if you go after the fascial system, you know, optimize it, get it healthy so that it can repair tendons and ligaments. All right, uh, second category is joint pain. And, you know, that could be um, something like in your spine, it could be um, in your shoulder, like uh, it could be hip bursitis, for example. So bursitis um, in the hip is a great example of joint pain, um, where the bursa in the joint itself is inflamed and irritated. Um, but most of the time in joint pain, in my experience, the joint is either irritated um, or in danger of dislocation, potentially. Um, and that's why you're getting a pain signal. And it's in that state, usually because of restricted fascia or tight fascia, nearby or potentially far away. So if we take pelvic instability, for example, um, which you might classify as joint pain, um, we're getting a little overlapping here. Because I think they're all kind of related, right? We have tendons and ligaments everywhere, we have joints everywhere, we have soft tissue, and fascia is connective tissue that connects it all. Um, but pel pelvic instability, it's going to be usually the fascia in your legs, causing a pelvic um, tilt, shift, uh, you know, something like that. And then there's compensations that occur, uh, and then you end up with pain when you can't compensate anymore. Um, so fascia plays a huge role in joint pain. You also want to open up those fascial channels to get that hyaluronic acid, the water and the blood and the collagen into the area that needs healing. So whether it is that bursa or the joint itself, like arthritis would be one category of joint pain. Your joint needs collagen, water, you know, the hyaluronic acid, the water and the blood, the nutrients that it requires to rebuild and repair itself. Uh, so opening up your fascial system around the injured joint. And then, of course, you always want to find the root cause. So just going to nearby the joint isn't necessarily going to be the root cause for you. Um, but that is fascia's role in joint pain. And then we've got soft tissue pain. And I'm going to say, you know, that could just be like anything from sore muscles to achy tissue to uh, myofascial pain syndrome, connective tissue disorders, fibromyalgia, um, or maybe even like nerve pain that's more in the soft tissue than a joint, perhaps, um, where you feel it, for example. Uh, and this we could spend a lot of time on because there's a lot here. Um, but I've said this in other videos, but fascia has pain receptors within it. So you can feel pain in your fascia. It's totally possible. And so could there be a role here between the pain receptors in your fascia and something like myofascial pain syndrome? I think so. 
Um, could there be a relationship between the state of your fascia, maybe, and your nervous system, and how stressed you are, or whether you're in fight, flight, or freeze response a lot, or as we've talked about in other videos, fascia actually can respond to chemical messengers like fear, and then thicken to try to protect you, and then you end up with, you know, pain signals because your body's detecting you're in danger or that something's wrong chronically, right? Um, so lots here to explore, um, but this is just that general, again, overview of fascia's role in pain and dysfunction. But also I wanted to reverse engineer everything I just said um, and think about how to use uh, you know, fascial release and fascial optimization to get healthy so you have happy and healthy tendons and ligaments, happy joints, and happy soft tissue. Um, and then of course consider, you know, placebo and nocebo and how those might be impacting you. And when I say that, I just mean like, what are your beliefs? What are, you know, the thoughts you're thinking on a daily basis? How do you view your own body? Lots to dive in here as well. Um, but just like to think about that because we have a lot of these nerves um, that travel, you know, within this process through your body, through the nervous system, through the fascia. So it's all connected and it's all gonna impact one another. So those are the three main pain, pain categories and fascia's role. So tell me your number one takeaway from this video, what really jumped out at you? And if you're currently struggling with pain, injury, or you know, maybe even just a little dysfunction or not feeling 100%, which category do you think you're in? And then what can you do to help yourself. I have tons of resources on this channel. You have no excuses. There's a search function, hundreds of videos and blog posts you can find to help yourself for head to toe issues, whether we're talking, you know, fascia release or nervous system stuff or more theoretical, you know, videos so that you can apply what you're learning with precision. Um, so share that below. If you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you want to join my email community, I do send out email trainings every once in a while that I don't share anywhere else. And you'll also get some free resources to help you make use of everything I'm doing here at Mobility Mastery. So with that, can't wait to read your comments. So pop them below. I'll see you there and I will see you next time. Bye guys. Bye.